Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Walker Pinamia, and I am chair of the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics, and Social Policy. So happy to have you here for this, um, our, one of our virtual dialogues looking at environmental human rights defenders in the pandemic. And we're looking at the Geneva Roadmap and strengthening IUCN action. A little bit of housekeeping first. Um, I do want to alert you that there is interpretation in Spanish, French, and English. Hay interpretación en español, francés, y inglés. You simply need to go to the button and choose your language. Tiene que mirar el botón y escoger su idioma. Um, in addition, I do want to advise everyone that we will be recording this dialogue um, and we will also be sharing it vis-a-vis -vis Facebook Live. Um, we expect this to be a very exciting dialogue and discussion and we do hope to have time at the end for um, discussion and question and dialogue with our speakers. This session is organized in conjunction with the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics and Social Policy, CIS, the University of Geneva, um, the Environment of Peace Initiative and IUCN Netherlands. So behalf, on behalf of CIS, I would like to welcome you, but I'm gonna pass off to my other colleagues as well to give a welcome. Jörg Bassinger from the University of Geneva Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. It's a great pleasure to uh, say hello, also on behalf of the Institute and Research Hub for Environmental Governance and Territorial Development at the University of Geneva, a place that regroups around 60 researchers from different social science disciplines who work in many uh, cases at the interface of science, policy and practice. One of uh, our dear collaborators is Peter Larson, of course, who has worked tirelessly uh, for many years, uh, and especially since uh, the spring in the context of uh, the Geneva Roadmap uh, in support of the environmental human uh, rights defenders issue. And it's a great, great pleasure to be associated with this uh, launch event today. I think the Geneva Roadmap is just that, it's a roadmap but it's a map that has a road that leads to many places. One important place, of course, is the World Conservation Congress that has been postponed twice now. Uh, we'll hope it'll take place and it'll take place uh, in, uh, in physical presence. Uh, another one is an environmental peace building conference that will be held in Geneva in February, 2022. And um, another one that I'd like to mention here that you just mentioned as well, Kristen, is the Environment of Peace 2022 initiative um, spearheaded by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, um, an initiative to mark the 50th anniversary of, of uh, the Stockholm conference. And one I hope we will be able to um, um, put in an, in an important place the environmental uh, defenders issue. So welcome to everybody, and I look forward to this wonderful dialogue. Thank you. I also want to pass to our other co-host, Liliana Jarou from IUCN Netherlands. Liliana? Yes, hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome from, uh, from Amsterdam. I hope you can hear me. I just had a very, uh, oh, the, the electricity went, went out, and I'm calling with my phone. but. Uh, um, uh, well, I'm glad this is finally happening. As, as, as you know, uh, we have been working on with environmental human for a while. I have more time later to share some of our lessons learned. For now, I want to say only hello, and I'm very excited to see uh, how we can strengthen the cooperation within the ICN as a union. Uh, that is all I can say. I would like to say for now. Great, thank you. And on behalf of the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics and Social Policy, this is obviously a critical issue for the union. Um, and we are happy to be able to mobilize this dialogue and discussion. Um, these issues um, hit at the core of the work of IUCN and our membership. And it's an area where we need to look at improving the action we have, but also supporting our large membership. This session will be organized into four segments. Um, the first will look at a film related to environmental defenders. The second will look at the situation of the pandemic and the challenges to environmental defenders. Then we'll look about learning from lessons learned. And then finally, how do we move forward and how do we work on the efforts of IUCN to strengthen these issues in the work, but also look at how in the context of the pandemic. 
So I'm going to pass to Peter Larson at the moment to give us an overview of the. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you to, for all the introductions. So really the theme here, a few introductory words in general, uh, we're talking about the human rights defend environmental human rights defenders and the pandemic, the Geneva roadmap and strengthening IUCN action. And I want to say a, a few brief words about why we're here in the first place. Uh, and that is indeed for us that the environmental crisis we're facing is also a crisis for environmental human rights defenders killings and threats are widespread. And indeed within the IUCN network, we see colleagues, we see members, scientists, partner organizations and communities deeply affected by this crisis personally in their families and their networks. So we might say that indeed the heart of the union activity is under attack. And in a sense, if we think collectively that we are at risk. At the same time, we're seeing growing secretariat membership and commission mobilization around this, responding to the kinds of issues that I heard from people, for example, from IUCN Honduras, who said to me, threats against us, killings, and leaders who watch over nature, conservation have not stopped. It's continuing. Uh, and indeed, under the pandemic, we're seeing that this whole a uh, year that was thought as being a super year for biodiversity is indeed revealing a triple crisis. Look to the situation of indigenous peoples disproportionately affected by the COVID, high impacts also on leadership and defenders standing up. Defenders in many cases becoming targets now, the lockdown turning into a crackdown as some of these news items below indicate. And we see also growing resource pressures in some contexts uh, with depth, uh, pushing people into sort of intensifying the kinds of conflicts that are leading to defender issues. So a lot of this basically led to a dialogue in the Geneva roadmap uh, earlier this year, uh, bringing together academia, civil society organizations and defender networks, as well as UN representatives to try to dialogue about understanding this crisis and informing responses to the challenge. And in a sense, uh, the film that you're going to be seeing in a, in, in a little, in a few couple of minutes, which uh, was put together for us by, by Melanie Nilsson from, from Drumbeat, uh, tries to, to bring out the testimonies uh, from participants in the meeting uh, to try to show what the issues are and also show the relevance of this for concerted IUCN action. So where are we today? In a sense, we have a long, long history of IUCN responding to individual cases, a number of efforts, letters, informal action, engagement. Uh, we also see individual members taking this up, as well as national commission action. We have IUCN Netherlands here, for example, today, but we also see fragmented action, fragmented efforts as a union. And indeed, we might say the environmental defenders crisis is not going to be solved through individual activities. We remain in some respects still divided as a conservation community, but it's time to come together in solidarity. It's time for more dialogue and it's time for strategic engagement within and beyond the union on these issues. We need to move from reactive to strategic responses. It's the importance of dialogue. And with those words, I wanna stop. And I, I really, uh, you know, just to, to give you a sense of where that whole Geneva dialogue spirit ended and where in a sense where we, the, the film hopes, us, hopes to keep that momentum alive and share perspectives from the participants that came to Geneva at that point of time. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Um, can we switch the screen now and share the video? You could stop sharing even, thank you and then we'll share the video. Please note that the video, the link to the video will also be put in the chat. So if there's some issues with streaming, individuals can see it directly in the chat, but we will share it directly now. We are easy targets. If you keep silent, it doesn't help. It's very important for us to, as environmental defenders, to unite. Environmental defenders uh, mostly are uh, people like indigenous uh, peoples, peasants, fisher folks whose daily lives is interlinked with uh, the environment, with their land, with the sea so these are 
you know, naturally, even they, they don't know, they are the environmental defenders. Desde que o meu irmão José Cláudio e minha cunhada foram assassinados em 2011, nós lutamos por justiça. Muitos dos companheiros estão sofrendo ameaças de morte como eu. Em outubro do ano passado, nós recebemos duas cartas de ameaça de morte direta, dizendo que vai matar. Um telefonema não é capaz de fazer a segurança da vida de um defensor. E eu temo pela minha vida, pela vida das minhas filhas, pela vida das minhas irmãs, dos meus irmãos. I feel like it, it's worth living if you do what you feel is important. I'm going against some people in the government and the companies that are destroying the environment. There is no proper judicial system in Russia, so you basically is you are under the threat like all the time because of the police that can violate human rights abuse and uh, you know uh, violence uh, committed uh, by forces you expect uh, not to be the perpetrators but the protector of their rights but uh, in reality they, they are the ones who are violating we have no choice but to uh, fight back push back to gain that democratic space. We were evicted from our ancestral home. The Sengwer community is not against conservation. We are the best conservators. We are the people who understand what the forest means. We are beekeeping community. We are hunters. That is our way of life. We are the people that can address the issues of the climate change. We know how to take care of the forest. I really feel better when I unite with other people that are concerned about the same problems as me. I think to do activism, to care for climate, people who are not protected, um, like activists, they should be protected first so they can have the freedom to express their opinion on the climate change and uh, on the other issues. So without this, it's just, There's just no, sp no space for civil society, no space for the action, no space for the change. The struggle for the environment is a struggle for the people. Nothing about us without us. We are sticking to that thing. Uma floresta sozinha, ela não é capaz de se defender. E ela precisa de nós para continuar em pé. E é exatamente a nós que eles estão atacando. Se o mundo começar a pressionar o governo Bolsonaro quanto à vida dos seus defensores, quanto à vida da floresta, eu tenho certeza que nós seremos olhados de outra forma. I'm appalled by uh, by the lack of action. Believe me, I've been uh, uh, moved by all those testimonies of uh, the victims uh, that uh, tells us uh, uh, the attacks, the threat that are facing uh, from so many actors. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, literature uh, written on, on the topic. Uh, NGOs, uh, academics, uh, uh, the UN as well. We have very strong resolution adopted, and now it's time to deliver. It's time to implement uh, and to join our efforts uh, to make sure that uh, those who are on the forefront of the battle uh, would not face any more threats and attacks uh, by uh, different uh, actors. So the Geneva roadmap uh, is the first uh, step by which uh, all uh, we could uh, join our efforts. Uh, We see diverse crisis patterns across the world, so it's time to listen now, it's time to act. And this is also what has brought many of us together to start thinking about a Geneva roadmap for collective action, engaging many of the organizations, many of the defenders, many of the researchers, academia as well, two days of debates, engaging UN special rapporteurs, and we were also attempting to learn from defenders. So the roadmap itself is based on initiatives which are on the way. Who is doing what? How are we going to do? What are the collective targets we want to reach? The first one is to reverse the tide, the need to have a civic uh, social space. Uh, we also worked on how to bridge actions and also sometimes to bridge vocabulary so that we can understand and, 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 and work together much better. We also worked on how to break isolation and, and to provide more access to protection. How do we think we are going to protect the environment if we kill or put in jail or harass those who are protecting the environment? 
One of the most important human rights of the 21st century is the right to live in a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So we have an opportunity in 2020 to make a great leap forward in terms of recognizing the right to a healthy environment, which in turn would empower environmental human rights defenders. You know, what environmental defenders are doing, actually what communities are doing, what indigenous peoples are doing, defending the rights to their lands and defending nature, is a job that they're doing on behalf of all of us. When we think about nature, you think about these beautiful places and they're the ones taking care every day of those places. I truly believe that we have to realize that this is everybody's job and that we have some champions on the field. This should be in our veins because without nature, humanity will not thrive. We call for appropriate justice we call for the respect of the human rights and for people to understand that we all depend on nature. We call for decisive measures helping the ones that right now are putting themselves at risk to protect natural resources that we depend on. Se nós nos calarmos outros defensores serão assassinados. Thank you. Um, I think um, this film sets the stage well for the conversation that we're going to have, that those that we are working with are at the forefront of these issues and the protection of the planet. And I think what we're gonna do now is we're, we'll transition to um, hear from um, some environmental defenders in this situation and what they're doing. I'd first like to ask uh, Ms. Judy Pas Pasmio from the Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Right, LILAC in the Philippines. Um, I'll give you the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and good evening. Well, good morning to you and good afternoon. Um, Yes, I'm gonna try very hard. So I'm afraid of Crispin to keep in to keep the five minutes. Um, there's no official figure for the indigenous population in the Philippines. There have been attempts to include ethnicity variable in the population census, but still have not resulted to an official number. And so, unless the indigenous peoples are counted, then they remain invisible to the government and therefore excluded in the policy considerations and services. The pandemic has surfaced the, this continuing problem, their invisibility, therefore the exclusion and isolation of indigenous women. A lot of indigenous women who we have tried to reach from our homes, given that we're all in lockdown, were surprised and anxious about the lockdown. No coherent information has reached them about COVID-19. What is this? How can we protect ourselves from this virus? All they knew is that they were being prevented to go out of their communities, Military and police were everywhere, including in their farms and entry to the forests. These were the stories shared to us by the indigenous women partners. In one conflict area between the indigenous community and a coffee plantation in Mindanao, in the southern part of the Philippines, company security guards and armed men were guarding the remaining plot of land that the Blaans were planting to corn. And they were told that they could not farm because of COVID-19. Tarsila, the young woman who we had to who had to assume community leadership because her father, her husband, and her two brothers who were killed by the military expressed fear that after the lockdown, they will lose their remaining small plots of farm. In Barangay de Dipio Casibu, Nueva Vizcaya, in, in the northern part of the zone, the Tuwali women are leading the human barricade that they have been set up since that they have set up since last year to prevent the coming in of Oceana Gold Mining Corporation. The mining permit of Oceana has expired last year. Last March, 100 policemen accompanied the trucks of Oceana and forced their way through the small barricade of the village road, causing injuries and trauma within the indigenous women. After this incident, 14 of the indigenous women were charged with breaking the quarantine protocols. This as they worry about their source of food for the next week, while others for the next day. Even pre-COVID, Food security has been a major issue for them. Their lands and forests have been ravaged by open pit mining, the huge tracts of uh, coffee plantations, logging, and are being secured for mega dams. Pre-COVID, the impacts of climate change have been harsh to their harvests, intense rainfalls, intense drought. 
With COVID and the lockdown, their economic situation has really worsened. And what do they get from their government, from our government? Harsh military responses. In response to COVID, LILAC launched Babayanihan. It's our, uh, our program, Women to Women Solidarity, providing modest relief packs of food and um, hygiene kits. The indigenous women are our first responders. They bravely risk the exposure to COVID-19 and passing through military checkpoints. They try to reach communities deep in the forests or high up in the mountains. And because of this, they are being harassed, tagged as rebel sympathizers, if not rebels themselves. The indigenous women are in the forefront of the struggle to defend their land, their food source, their forest, which are sources of herbs, traditional medicines, immunity boosters, which could be part of their protection, especially in this time of pandemic and make them less vulnerable. But this pandemic has paved the way for more corporate-led economic agenda. Mining is now being touted as one of the pillars of economic recovery. We also hear the Department of Agriculture saying that we should develop idle lands within ancestral domain into food production. So again, this is a way to legally land grab ancestral domains for the purpose of corporate profit. There is a pending bill in the Congress that aims to pass track investments today in this time of pandemic. The indigenous women oppose these projects, these programs in defense of their land. Their survival as people depend on their land, so no policy or laws should be used against them. As it is, the Philippines is recorded as one of the countries with having the most number in the whole world of land rights defenders being killed. Why are we killing those who protect their land, those who struggle for their survival? The Duterte government has identified communism and terrorism as the main threat of our country, not COVID-19, when we have an average of 2,000 new cases daily and the number is increasing in the provinces and rural areas. Not poverty as brought about by one of the longest, if not the longest, lockdown policy in the world. It is during the pandemic that the anti-terror law has been passed. We see this as a law legitimizing the criminalization and harassment and killings of activists. And one of the largest budgets goes to the agency which handles anti-insurgency program of the government. One of the projects of this, of this agency, the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, is the provision of livelihood projects to indigenous communities. But to be able to avail of these uh, livelihood projects, you have to voluntarily surrender first to be given the project. So our partners ask, surrender as what? We are no terrorists. They are very vocal in their criticisms, in their opposition against mining in their areas, in the different extractive projects in their communities, and the lack of consent processes. But we are no terrorists, they assert. Last Friday, we had an online gathering of indigenous women and human rights defenders. All of them were being harassed, receiving threats. One was being asked to surrender. One was put on a drug watch list under the war on drugs. Um, and this program under the Duterte administration has already killed more than 26,000 poor women and men, all cases without due process. Young woman went into hiding because she has been receiving threats through text and, and Facebook posts about being hunted down, raped and killed. We are living in a harsh environment. Super typhoons which are coming one after the other these weeks are devastating the small food production that indigenous women and their families have. The rains are also causing perilous floods in mining affected areas. But there is a silver lining in this situation of violence in different forms. The women are there for women through the relief packages that we continue to distribute, through the regular conversations online that we strive to provide as a platform for sharing and connecting, through mass texting, or the information sharing through texts on the phone. The Women to Women Solidarity, which LILAC is a part of, has been a life force that inspires, encourages, and pushes women to be less afraid and more hopeful as they continue to be in the forefront of the struggle for their rights as indigenous, as women, for a more nurturing and equipped, equitable recovery program and a life with dignity. Thank you for letting me share this. Thank you, Judy. And I think we've heard from her inter intervention and experience from the Philippines. Existing issues 
with the government have only been exacerbated now with the lockdown of COVID. Um, the invisibility and exclusion of Indigenous peoples in, in the context of the Philippines continues to increase, especially in the context of women. Um, threats and intimidation continue to um, damage the communities, but also put them in grave danger. And I think, you know, as Judy highlighted, positive things are the women and women solidarity in this piece. Um, we're going to now shift to um, Africa and we're going to hear from Mr. Kenyike Sena um, from the Indigenous Peoples Coordinating Committee of Africa. Kenyike? Can you put your mic on? There we go. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for this opportunity. Once again, it's always a a privilege not only for me but for the communities to 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 to, to share out their ideas to to tell uh, what their the situation are in their villages so uh, as the discussion is going the pandemic continues to impact negatively on the environmental defenders and their communities not only in africa but um, elsewhere as you have seen from uh, some of the examples uh, we have been given uh, and uh, interestingly, as the pandemic impacts negatively on the people, in some situations, it seems like it has created opportunities for violations as the world is focused elsewhere. The world is focused on the pandemic, but when what we see in, in some countries in Africa, we see greater effort by government uh, to protect uh, the environment. And consequently, we see a lot of evictions going on in Kenya, a lot of arrests, in the other countries in Africa that I'll just mention as we go by, it is it. So we, it, it, it's a bit uh, strange because uh, rather than the government actually trying to look at how now to uh, address the rights of these communities again as this pandemic, uh, the violations not only by governments but also by the private sector uh, is increasing. Uh, however, the pandemic has slowed down life generally, yes, but it has not slowed down the struggle uh, by the communities and environmental defenders, the struggle for their, for their right, land rights, territories and resources. So, but as we continue with this struggle, we see uh, some of the new challenges that we see them facing, as has been said, death, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we hear cases of deaths in parts of Kenya, maybe Congo Basin and et cetera. And whenever uh, death resulting from either direct violation of the rights or death resulting from the pandemic itself. So it's a two wrong thing. And when we see the people who are, the, the indigenous leaders who are dying from the pandemic are those leaders who have been part of the struggle for a very long time. So they die without institutional memory, without, uh, without, um, uh, without most, in most cases, measures to for that intergenerational uh, transfer of knowledge for the younger generation to continue uh, pushing, uh, pushing for their struggles post uh, the pandemic. We see that uh, the pandemic has also reduced mobility, uh, both internally and externally, to for environmental defenders. That means now they are most of us are restricted into our villages. We cannot move out and monitor what is happening, network with others and et cetera. And that also restricts the ability for us to self-organize. So because now the number of meetings have been reduced, we don't participate in processes, uh, while at the same time decision making are still going on in various levels of government. Uh, communication remains a major, major challenge in indigenous people's territories because of low communication uh, penetration. So even a webinar like this, very few indigenous activists, uh, indigenous uh, environmental defenders can be part of such a very important discussion because of lack of technology, wherever they are. And of course, a lot of resources were diverted from environmental uh, rights, definitely to strategies to address COVID-19. And that actually uh, had a big impact on the ability of these activists to continue, in the environmental defenders to continue with their, with their struggles. So, um, to me, I was looking at what can, what can be the role of IUCN, its members, and the commissions. So, first of all, I need I think uh, to I, th I think I need to congratulate IUCN for the uh, the very numerous resolutions it has uh, passed on indigenous people's rights. Uh, unfortunately, I think there is very little awareness of all these resolutions passed present and coming resolutions, including the many that touch on indigenous people's rights that I saw 
uh, coming up for the World Conservation Congress. So I think there's a, a need to create awareness of these resolutions, especially among member states and private sector and indigenous peoples themselves, so that they can start utilizing these resolutions to reach out to, uh, to the various um, states and, and uh, private sector, among others. And as our friend from Philippines has said, the need for disaggregated data to understand the extent of environmental, uh, environmental defenders from indigenous communities who have been arrested, who have been died, who have died, and etc. Because these uh, disaggregated data, which is lacking, especially from Africa, where I come from, will enable informed decision making. Uh, there is need for more capacity and awareness on the people and nature basket as a framework for addressing IP rights generally. And I think I need to emphasize on this because uh, IUCN and all of us are pushing for that idea of people and nature. But when you look at the kind of evictions, the countries which are members of IUCN are not following that people and nature thing. How can people and nature live together? That's why we see evictions in Mao Forest, evictions in Cherangani, evictions everywhere. So <clears throat> what can the regional offices do to make sure that this discussion goes deeply into the minds of the policymakers, that it's time that people and nature uh, live together? So mainstreaming indigenous people's rights and IUCN programming is very important. And I think I've seen a resolution going to that direction, strengthening dialogue around um, uh, conflict management, very important because uh, that would reduce the instances for environmental defenders violations of their rights as they go about um, agitating for their rights. And then uh, what the other thing that we are doing is we are establishing a legal fund to support environmental defenders in their, in their work. And of course, there's need now to start looking at if this pandemic continues for quite a long time, how do we leverage technology to make sure that it's easily available uh, for environmental defenders and their communities so that they can communicate the challenges they are facing a bit more uh, efficiently, widely, uh, and um, regularly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, King Yiki. I think you raised some very important issues looking at um, while things may have slowed down in the pandemic that we are seeing an increase in the protection of nature, but with that, um, is also increased in violations and evictions due to lockdowns, due to more strict planning. I think what you highlight with respect to the, the efforts of IUCN, there are a number of resolutions out there um, and a number of uh, that need to look at how they're implemented and using the role of IUCN as a global convener, having both members of governments, indigenous peoples organizations and or organizations, how to mobilize that intersection between people and nature more effectively and striking that balance between um, protecting the environment, but protecting the people also within the context of that environment. So I would like to go now to Ms. Augustina Galgano from the Fundacion Pluralis to also hear from her perspective on these issues as well. Well, hi everybody. Thanks for this opportunity to share a women's environmental defenders reality from a Chaco region and wetlands. Well, first of all, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, the, the situation of human rights defenders, uh, it's very difficult with, with pandemic context, no? Uh, the, the mobility restrictions policies uh, does not allow uh, women to connect each other. That was something that every day they do and, and keep in touch. And at the same time, uh, our government increased the measures and the politics in favor of extractive activities. So they can move from their house and they can uh, continue their fights and in their territories in order to battle against these activities. So this context uh, makes women human rights defenders more isolated and more exposed uh, to vulnerable to vulnerability, vulnerabilities that they suffer, not only as, as, as for uh, as, uh, their jobs and their work as, as fighters, but also because uh, they are women and, and the most uh, like discrimination and problems that as a gender uh, uh, problem cause. So the numbers of cases of gender-based violence has increased, the numbers of, of hours that women spend of care work has rise, so, and, and they are still, and they don't have access uh, to 
some uh, uh, measures or um, uh, politics to pr protect themselves uh, from violence uh, and from uh, local security protection. So, but uh, in order to uh, to help them in Plurales, we designed a platform that is, is called a plat a communicate a collaboration security and protection platform. I'm going to share you uh, my presentation about this very quickly. Sorry. So this is, a, an is an strategy that we developed from Plurales in order to keep uh, and maintain the communications with the women uh, defenders. And this, uh, this uh, platform allows them to alert in a quickly, uh, in a quickly way what was happening in their territories and how uh, we can help them uh, in an agile uh, way. So it's a tool for security and collective communication. It's a tool to keep women and, uh, connected. They can communicate and alert quickly, safely about their problems in their territories. Also, uh, we try to uh, get, uh, give them some uh, special funds to to uh, for for this uh, a special moment of the pandemic. Also, with this tool, they can strengthen their capacity for political advocacy, and they and it's a space uh, to generate data in order to elevate and scale these demands to the United Nations uh, reporters for uh, human rights, um, and uh, to uh, keep keep in touch each each others. So. Um, as I said, this, uh, this is a tool that give, uh, gave to them a safe environment. Uh, uh, they can easily and uh, uh, agile communication and they can alert and report problems quickly. Uh, we have a, an, a standard survey uh, to make the reporter or the alert. They can publish in notes and news and they can sharing events of, of or, or some uh, Yes, events and speaking that they are doing. So uh, we know that the the situation is very, very, very difficult, and the lack of access of internet and communication uh, doesn't uh, that don't uh, help them. But uh, this this tool is very, very useful for them to keep in touch and and to uh, feel safe together that is very important in a, in a context uh, like this and, uh, in where they are they are very isolated thank you thank you very much augustina i think you know i think your your intervention talking about women and especially the issues of gender based violence um, that are connected with the environment also not, right? I think what you have highlighted um, was also highlighted by uh, Judy and Kenyike, the issues of communication and how do you report and how do you get more data? Um, it's increasingly important as we look at this issue. Um, we do, we have communities who have access to um, phones who can provide that, but we also have communities who do not have that access. And that's something that needs to be evaluated about how we do that. So you've already started brought us into looking at um, a bit of this discussion on lessons learned. Um, and I'd like to sort of move to our next segment, which is really gonna understand um, learning from experience um, and, and lessons and how we can better support and more effectively support environmental human rights defenders. So I'm gonna pass, um, pass it on to Liliana to talk about the work that IUCN Netherlands has done and the lessons learned from this process. Liliana, hopefully we have good connectivity. You're, it looks like you're I back hope online. So. Let's try. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, as I, I mentioned at the beginning in my welcoming words, uh, I have some time here to explain and to share with you uh, the process that we have had uh, um, with as an organization. Um, as a conservation organization, we, don't, we do not normally circulate among civil society groups working on human rights issues. Uh, but it was in our programs that we were increasingly confronted with the reality that our partners were threatened 
civil liberties were restricted. In some cases, we had some uh, killings. Uh, so that's the reason why we have started up a project uh, that lasted almost four years that was specifically dedicated uh, to defending our defenders. Uh, we, did, we did it because, as I said, uh, the, the, we were aware of the increasing uh, criminalization and the violence that our partners were uh, encountering, also some of our personnel at, at the office. So, uh, and also we realized that this violence not only uh, is a violation of human rights, but is also creating a vicious circle, which erodes the operational space of, of, of conservation and, and, and environmental organizations that we are seeing all over the world. All the organizations working on natural resources are experiencing this. Uh, so we had this, uh, this program that consisted in uh, five interventions in several countries uh, with practical, uh, interventions like uh, establishment of emergency funds, uh, circle of legal support, offering security trainings, and also other interventions aiming to uh, gain more awareness uh, of the environmental defenders issues and also improving the protection of, of uh, environmental human rights defenders at international and regional and national law. And uh, so did with it for four years and uh, we learned a lot which interventions are, are more useful of, than others. We also had several consultations with defenders themselves and they told us what they wanted to see and not so much what we wanted to see, which was very important uh, to, uh, to, for us. And also we uh, then uh, after this first phase, we moved to a, a more uh, integrated approach. We, we thought that we needed these interventions in all our projects, so we mainstreamed uh, the environmental defenders uh, reality in, in other projects and we decided to, um, to move also to a more preventive approach and uh, because these defenders are not working only for, for one issue, but they are protecting communities and territories and those areas that we want to see also conserved. So example of this kind of prevention, preventive work are uh, initiatives that are removing barriers to participation. So for example, strengthening the ethnic processes, the first prior informed consent, because exclusion uh, tends to uh, increase risks, uh, but also, uh, all the, the interventions that uh, uh, deliver more access to information. We also try to uh, change the narrative because narratives matter. Uh, defenders are not criminal, but they are important. Uh, they, they play an important role on sustainable development and also collective protection uh, because we heard from defenders that they would not, uh, to, not to see uh, the, the individual approach that many Western organizations have. Uh, we heard we heard a lot of examples about the gender approach that also for us uh, are important lessons learned. And the way forward for us is uh, is now uh, tackling the the challenges that we have uh, when working with with conservation and natural resources. Some of them are uh, the lack of political will that we see uh, in in many many of the countries we work. Uh, this is evident when we see that uh, the absence of safeguards uh, to guarantee the, the security of indigenous peoples, also in the light of extractivism, uh, but also is, is still continued in the abandonment and, and marginalization of communities. The promoted development projects that we see uh, that are many, many, many times contrary to the vision of, develop, of, of defenders, uh, the companies that have a different, uh, the, the balance of power that are between companies and the local communities. We need to address those, those issues. And uh, well, uh, there are so many examples I go, can go on forever. Uh, but for us, uh, it's, all these challenges are showing us uh, a way forward and, and, uh, and the strategies that we are implementing in our projects is uh, also networking with others to pull resources. I think that the example of the Geneva roadmap is a good example of that. And this is the reason why we are supporting this initiative. We have to work outside the conservation community only uh, and continue building capacities for environmental human rights defenders, developing warning, uh, warning, early warning mechanisms and invest more and more in collective protection 
collective leaderships, uh, technological tools like the one we saw with the plurales, and participatory analysis of, of, of power, uh, power relationship uh, and threats. Uh, so these are for now some of the lessons learned I wanted to share with you. Uh, I was lucky to have good connection. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Liliana. Um, so we're gonna just jump to um, looking at um, some additional experiences and we'll have Jose Alwin who is with the ICCA Consortium and we'll speak to some additional lessons learned through the work of the ICCA Consortium. Jose? Thank you for, for this invitation. Um, I'd like to thank especially Peter, Kirsten and Liliana for their leadership uh, on, on this matter. I'm here representing the uh, ICCA Consortium, a consortium of territories of life, uh, indigenous and community conservation areas throughout the world. And, and I'm also here uh, on behalf of uh, the Observatorio Ciudadano, which is Citizens Watch based in Chile, um, which has been active in, in uh, um, in the defense of uh, territories of, of life. Um, I basically, um, I want the, the context in, in which we're living this year is particularly uh, threatening uh, to environmental human rights defenders. Uh, we see a continuation of, uh, of uh, threats and killings of uh, these defenders worldwide and Latin America continues to be uh, the, the, the continent, the region of the world where uh, most of these killings uh, take place. And, and as we know, these killings are just the tip of the, the iceberg, uh, because behind these killings are many, many threats and, and, uh, and many uh, aspects of criminalization. And we have the, the pandemia, and uh, as it was documented by recently by uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that there's been a, an intensification of extractivism uh, on indigenous and communal lands in, uh, throughout the, the, the world. Uh, we, we heard from the Philippines and in the context of the Andes, um, mining continues to be uh, um, expanding COVID into, into Andean areas and in the Amazon, it's uh, documented more than 35,000 uh, people being contaged, uh, particularly on uh, indigenous and communal lands. Uh, we see states of emergency and lockdown impeding mobilization of hu environmental human rights defenders to protect their lands. We see confinements uh, resulting in killings uh, of these uh, defenders in Asia and Latin America, and we see imprisonment of environmental human rights defenders, uh, uh, exposing them to uh, further contagion as it has occurred with the uh, Mapuche environmental rights defenders in, in Chile. Uh, I wanted to refer to what we have been doing from the consortium, particularly from the working group on defending territories of life Defenders. Uh, we, we have continued to document uh, uh, ICCAs globally, the, their legal status, but putting special attention on the rights of, uh, uh, on the situation of environmental rights defenders on 20 states throughout, uh, throughout the Africa, Latin America, and Asia. We, we have tried to uh, provide some legal support although the consortium itself has no capacities to provide legal support through networks such as Natural Justice and ILC in Africa and uh, Observatorio Ciudadano and Podeca in, in, in Honduras uh, and also ILC, we've tried to provide some legal aid. And the alerts policy has continued to be used as a means to uh, uh, denounce uh, the uh, impacts on environmental human rights defenders, M more than 10 of these alerts. Uh, one in the context of the Amazon was successful in terms of uh, denouncing uh, 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 oil company operating in, on, uh, the, in the Amazon on indigenous territories of the Wampis and Ashwar and expanding COVID uh, 
uh, this led to uh, legal actions, which finally uh, uh, resulted in, in the uh, halt of the uh, oil projects in, in that area. Uh, campaigning has also been part of the work that we've been doing uh, throughout the different uh, coalitions that we, we're part of and uh, highlighting the situation of uh, uh, indigenous uh, rights defenders. In the case of a, a, a Koya uh, leader, a woman leader uh, opposing Canadian mining in northern Chile has been part of that campaign. Uh, there's been threats to her um, due to her opposition to uh, mining operations. And, and of course, uh, uh, and this uh, event is part of that strategy, and we've joined the, the, the efforts uh, uh, in Geneva with the Geneva Roadmap in influencing the international agenda. Um, we, 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 we're concerned of the lack of progress in the implementation of uh, uh, the Human Rights Resolution, Human Rights Council Resolution on Environmental Human Rights Defenders, notwithstanding the continuation of threats uh, to these uh, defenders. Uh, uh, we've also tried to support uh, the special procedures. So I referred to, to the report by uh, the new Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Rights, Francisco Gali, trying to provide the information on, on the situations that are taking place and, and how uh, COVID is being used by states and by business uh, to continue their operations and uh, the situation of uh, environmental rights defenders continues to be critical. There's other special procedures to, to which we relate. There's a UN working group on business and human rights because uh, uh, many of these threats to uh, environmental rights defenders are done uh, either directly or in complicity with corporate uh, uh, um, entities. So uh, the, uh, targeting the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, which is in the moment thinking uh, of the guiding principles and how to, would they be applied for the next 10 years is crucial. Of course, uh, supporting the, the UE, IUCN motion uh, 39 on the protection of environment and human and people's rights defenders is central. And uh, at the regional level in Latin America, uh, we have been supporting the ratification of the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice on environmental matters, uh, which uh, has special provisions to protect and promote access to justice uh, for environmental rights offenders. Uh, we, we've been, uh, uh, it's taken some time, but now there's been 11 ratifications with the ratification of uh, Argentina and Mexico. So hopefully the uh, treaty will enter into effect soon. Uh, and of course this poses um, challenges and, and we wonder if the alliances that we have been building have been sufficient to document, to inform and to defend uh, uh, effectively uh, environmental human rights defenders. I think that there's, we have to think about the way in which we are working and how perhaps we're probably duplicating and we're not being uh, effective enough uh, because this is a reality that uh, statistics and, and experience from the ground uh, says that it's continuing and, and COVID has probably made it even worse. So we, we need to, and this is part of the alliances to, that we're building, we need to move forward in, in the international agenda in all of those uh, treaty bodies, special procedures, and regional uh, um, um, agendas that uh, need to be addressed to be more effective in the protection of environmental human rights defenses. And of course, uh, influencing the environmental agenda of, that we're talking about here especially when we take into consideration the fact that uh, the, the uh, environmental agenda uh, has, uh, um, is looking at expanding uh, the IG targets in, into 30 or even beyond uh, um, percent of the terrestrial lands to be protected. And we wonder how that relates to uh, the defense of those territories that, are, that, that is being made 
by indigenous peoples and by uh, communities. And we wonder how in the past there's been obviously a tension between the conservation world and uh, these communities that are defending the territories of life. So we need to strengthen that agenda uh, in order to avoid that clash and in order to, uh, to generate more synergy and to protect uh, communities that are defending their territories. Uh, I'll leave it there because of time. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Jose. I think um, I think Liliana and Jose brought together some very good points. Um, one is understanding what we do in the context of conservation and planning. It's not a, environmental offenders aside. It's part of what we do every day and understanding the planning and the policy approaches to those things. I think Jose also uh, raises some important issues related to the uh, sufficiency of our alliances. Are they effective? Are they efficient? Um, I think through these conversations here so far today, we there needs to be the local context and supporting directly on that ground. We need to understand regional uh, and national agreements and those responses. And then we under need to understand how we mobilize a global framework on these issues. Um, and then the importance of IUCN, again's role in this. Um, IUCN has a large voice in the world and how can it work more effectively to bring these actors together? So I'm gonna, um, in this session, I'm, I'm gonna pass now to Yves Lador with Earth Justice and, and he's gonna speak a little bit about opportunities in the context of training and thinking about IUCN. So Yves? Yes, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll be very brief in the sense that um, what I'm going to say is really in the line of what uh, Jose and uh, Liliana have just uh, really presented. Um, just to make things clear, as the, the roadmap has been mentioned more than once, and so that there is no confusion, um, the roadmap is, has not been conceived as one more uh, additional coalition. There is a number of uh, very well working coalitions, and there is also a network of coalitions. Um, what we wanted to do was after the resolution that was adopted by the Human Rights Council uh, last year for the protection of environmental defenders and, and setting a framework for their protection, we wanted to have a regular follow-up of how is this uh, resolution implemented and to do this with defenders, with their coalitions, with the concerned states, uh, because this is one of the uh, interesting aspect of the meetings here in Geneva is to have this direct uh, link and, and access to the states and also with the academic community and it's quite an interesting uh, endeavor to have been able to to start right away with the academic community in in this um, in this framework so one of our objective after all what we've heard was uh, precisely to see how we can try to go over these sectoral borders between the field of human rights and between uh, the environmental and the conservation sectors. And actually, uh, here we are mainly in the conservation sector. Environment is much broader. I'm thinking of when we work also with the people working on chemical issues and so on. That is another community with other type of rules and other issues, which also have to be taken into consideration. And what we hope, and in a way, uh, because of COVID, it has been uh, stopped. Uh, but what we hope is that at the uh, coming world, uh, the IUCN World Congress, uh, what was planned uh, previously will be maintained and that we will have the opportunity to do a training session co-organized by the Geneva University and the IUCN uh, committee uh, from, from the Netherlands uh, in order to see how it is possible to have an exchange of know-how and, and, and practices between these different communities because over the years we have years and, and even decades of experiences, practices, and so on, but they are not being communicated from one sector to the other. And of course, there's an issue of terminology, there's an issue of trust, there's a number of issues we have to go through, but I think there is really a possibility, and it's really regretful that because of COVID, we've been so much delayed, because it's, as we've heard, it's an urgent matter to have the possibility of the different communities to exchange experience and strengthen each other in this work. I must say that in this, um, in, in this sense, and I'll finish on that, uh, the fact of uh, the work we've been able to do with a special rapporteur, uh, the previous mandate holder on uh, uh, human rights defenders, with the current mandate holder on, on human rights and the environment, and of course, with the new uh, mandate holder on, on defenders, and I'm really happy uh, to have Mary uh, with us uh, here, has been really um, extremely useful because it helps the different communities to come together um, it, it's, it, it brings like a meeting point for the different communities. So we look forward to have this possibility to continue because this question of going over the borders, developing a, a common language and a common practice, like a, a community of, uh, of practice 
uh, is something which is very useful and we hope that uh, next year we will be able to do some real important step in that direction. Thank you very much. Great. Um, can I just ask even to check the part, the attendees issue? There's a there's a, something on the chat there. Um, thank you, Eve. Um, I really appreciate that, and I think the issue of bringing the communities together, um, learning from the know-how across communities, and the issue of language and understanding how we speak and the skill sets we bring together is extremely important. Um, so that said, I think you set the stage nicely for the next segment um, that we'll be looking at um, is, is moving forward. How can I use the strengthen um, this work in the current pandemic, but how can continue to work across communities? And I'll ask Rathel Aguilar, who is um, served as a role last year as acting director general of IUCN, but is the regional director um, for Latin America. So Gretel, uh, open the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And thank you for this invitation. I believe I'm allowed to speak in Spanish today. So I'm going to change from English to Spanish now, uh, so I'm from yeah, Latin America. Just yeah, a reminder, so, please do choose. Um, if you're listening in English, the translation will come in English, but if you want to listen in Spanish, please choose Spanish on the interpretation. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm here sitting in Costa Rica. I'm from Latin America. So I'm taking the luxury of speaking in my language. Um, so uh, let me, uh, primero permítanme agradecer a los organizadores, a, a IUCNC, a, a la Universidad de Ginebra, al Comité Holandés de Miembros de la OECD. Rafael, ¿Sí? I need to ask you to switch to the Spanish channel. Ah, okay. Correct yeah. translators, just so that you can speak into the Spanish channel and then okay. they can translate to English. It's the bottom I'm right sorry. hand. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, Spanish channel. Yes, then you can speak okay. and then it'll be translated no? to English. Yes, correct, thank you. Muy bien, muy bien. Espero haberlo hecho ya. Bueno, eh, daba el agradecimiento a los organizadores y también decirles eh, en nombre del director general eh, Bruno Oberle de la UICN que él hubiese deseado estar con ustedes, sin embargo, en este momento no le ha sido posible. Los defensores ambientales son personas que generalmente, pues todos viven en contacto con los recursos naturales Y como ya ustedes han oído de los expositores anteriores, pueden ser líderes comunales, pueden ser guardaparques, pueden ser eh, miembros de, de, de pueblos indígenas. A veces hablamos de números, pero yo quisiera al menos decir que esto se trata de personas. Esto se trata de Demetrio Pacheco en, en, en el Comité de Gestión Tambo Pata en Perú. Esto se trata de Homero González en México, de Raúl Hernández en México, en la Reserva de la Mariposa Monarca. Esto se trata de los, de los miembros de pueblos indígenas Mayana en Nicaragua, en la Reserva Biosfera de Bozaguas. Y podría usar los cinco minutos en nombrar miles y miles de defensores ambientales que no este año, sino desde hace muchos años han dado la vida para defender los recursos naturales y sus tierras. Esto no es nuevo, esto es algo que lleva años pasando y es ahora que ha tomado una relevancia y por eso yo quiero agradecer mucho los esfuerzos que hacen ahora muchísimas organizaciones en llevar esto a la luz. También quisiera decir, como ha dicho ya Agustina en su presentación, que esto se trata también de mujeres y de familias completas que defienden sus tierras y sus bosques. Ahora con la pandemia del COVID-19, la situación empeora y nuestros defensores están aún más expuestos. Recortes de presupuesto para materia de ambiente, menos apoyo a las comunidades en el campo, más líderes enfermos y un confinamiento hacen que la situación sea más difícil. Pero claramente no todo empieza con la muerte de líderes ambientales. Estos líderes generalmente reciben amenazas, calumnias, Y generalmente tienen muchísimas situaciones que viven antes de llegar a, a la muerte, antes de, antes de ser asesinados. Y este es el momento en que debemos de tener un acceso a la justicia pronta y cumplida. Este es el momento en que debemos de pedir a los gobiernos transparencia y acción. Este es el momento en que nuestros defensores deben de ser protegidos. 
Yo no quiero seguir nombrando nombres de personas que ya están muertas. Es mejor si estuviéramos nombrando las acciones que estamos haciendo para que nuestros defensores no mueran. Me han solicitado que hablen de los esfuerzos de la UICN y yo les voy a compartir eso, pero también permítanme compartir con usted y decirles que nuestros 1,400 miembros, nuestros 16,000 expertos en comisiones, un secretariado totalmente comprometido con la lucha de, de, de los defensores ambientales, no son suficientes. Que esto, esto debe de ser, estos esfuerzos deben de unirse a un movimiento aún más grande, a un movimiento en donde los defensores no se sientan desamparados, en donde sepan que no están solos, en donde no somos unos cuantos los que hablamos de proteger defensores ambientales, en donde sea un movimiento masivo, en donde ellos sepan que expresar sus ideas puede ser posible, como todos nosotros queremos tener la libertad para expresar nuestras propias ideas. Déjenme empezar con mociones. Algunos de ustedes ya han mencionado que UICN tiene una moción en este momento, pero tal vez no todos sepan qué es una moción de UICN. Bueno, rápidamente, la UICN en el cuatrienio 2021-2024, que es el que empieza el próximo año, eh, sus miembros pusieron 128 mociones con, conjuntamente, se han votado algunas y, y han sido aprobadas y otras están para discutirse en el Congreso Mundial de Conservación. La moción 039, llamada Protección a los denunciantes y defensores de los derechos humanos y de los pueblos en relación con el medio ambiente, es una de las mociones que será discutida en nuestro Congreso Mundial de Conservación. Esta moción no fue votada electrónicamente en la votación reciente que hicieron los miembros y que terminó el 21 de octubre y ahora en, ustedes pueden ver los resultados de 109 mociones en nuestro sitio web, pero no de esta. ¿Por qué no de esta? Porque eh, el grupo de trabajo de mociones decidió que esta, esta moción era muy importante, estratégica para la UICN y prefirió llevarla al Congreso cuando se realice. Creo que esto, esto es muy importante decirlo porque eso va a dar un espacio para la discusión, eso va a dar un espacio para hacer visible el tema cuando tengamos nuestro Congreso Mundial de Conservación. Mucha gente me dice, pero Gretel, ¿cuándo es el Congreso Mundial de Conservación? ¿Tendremos un, consejo, un Congreso Mundial de Conservación? Y yo les quiero asegurar que sí va a haber un Congreso Mundial de Conservación. Como todos ustedes saben, hay, hay, estamos todavía viviendo momentos muy difíciles de la pandemia, aquí en, en donde yo estoy no es una excepción, y, y pronto la UICN, cuando las cosas estén mejores, anunciaremos las fechas del Congreso. Estas mociones, y también oía a Callinque cuando dijo que, bueno, sí, que la UICN tiene muchas mociones, pero que necesitan más difusión. Y sí, eso es correcto. Y, y también lo escuché cuando dijo que teníamos que llegarle más a políticos y al sector privado. Correcto. En la UICN estamos haciendo un gran esfuerzo por darle seguimiento a nuestras mociones. Yo, como directora regional, les puedo contar que nosotros reportamos sobre todas las mociones que tienen relación con América Latina. Lo que quiere decir, por ejemplo, que en una moción sobre protección de defensores ambientales, nosotros, las oficinas regionales en el mundo, tendremos que reportar sobre las acciones. No solo el secretariado reporta, pero también los miembros. Nosotros llamamos a los miembros, a las comisiones, para saber qué se está haciendo, a los gobiernos también, para poder dar seguimiento a estas mociones y para poderlas hacer más que un documento. Eso lo hacemos en la OICN. Sí, por supuesto, se puede hacer más, mucho más, y estamos trabajando muy duro en esto. Déjenme decir nada más que esta moción, eh, la 039, es muy importante porque además destaca dentro, de, dentro de, de su texto algo que ha sido vital para la UICN y es el enfoque de conservación basado en derechos. Esto, esto, es, esto es importantísimo. ¿Por qué? Porque en muchísimas partes del mundo 
es imposible trabajar en conservación sin primero reconocer los derechos de las comunidades, sin reconocer los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Es, es como decir que lo, las metas de conservación son inalcanzables si nosotros no respetamos los derechos de las comunidades. Y por eso el enfoque de conservación en derechos es, como lo dice esta resolución, una de las partes más importantes de las acciones de UICN y, y se convierte en un elemento fundamental en la protección de los defensores ambientales. No existe conservación que no sea basada en, en primero reconocer los derechos de las comunidades. También esta, esta moción habla de otras mociones de la UICN, como, como lo han dicho algunos de los expositores. Sí, la UICN tiene otras mociones, de hecho tiene muchas mociones. Y, y habla también de, por ejemplo, la 4052, habla de la Declaración de las Naciones Unidas sobre los Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas, la 4119 habla sobre guardaparques dentro de las áreas protegidas y las zonas adyacentes, habla, hay otras que hablan sobre enfoques de conservación basados en derechos también, y, y, y podría nombrar muchísimas. Sin embargo, por esto para decir que una moción de, de defensores ambientales no está sola y no debe ser aislada, debe, debe de unirse con las mociones, con otras mociones que le dan sentido y que le dan fuerza. Esta moción también eh, alienta a las diversas partes de la UICN y a gobiernos, a organizaciones y al mismo sector privado a realizar acciones. Entre, entre ellas se exhorta a ejercer la debida diligencia, a aplicar el principio del consentimiento libre, previo e informado antes de tomar decisiones por comunidades. Nosotros en UICN estamos aplicando el consentimiento libre, previo e informado aún para los proyectos que implementamos en el campo. También llama a establecer diálogos directos con los miembros estatales, algo que se discutió, eh, que han discutido los, los panelistas anteriores y a realizar una política y plan de acción para informar sobre las actividades que se realicen en torno a la protección de los defensores ambientales. La moción es mucho más larga y yo no, no tengo tiempo para entrar en detalles, pero quería darles por lo menos un vistazo. Eh, a nivel del Consejo de la UICN también existe un grupo de trabajo sobre derechos humanos y conservación que tratará este tema a nivel de comisiones. Bueno, ustedes tienen hoy liderando este diálogo a la presidenta del CIS, de, la, de nuestra comisión CIS, a Kristen, eh, no, y esta comisión ha realizado eh, diálogos virtuales sobre el tema, también ha tenido una edición especial en su boletín Policy Matters. En la, en la Comisión de Mundial de Áreas Protegidas también se ha resaltado el rol de los guardaparques, y los guardaparques que han muerto también por defender eh, eh, áreas protegidas. En la Comisión Mundial de Derecho Ambiental se han hecho diálogos virtuales, se ha enfatizado profundamente en la necesidad de justicia pronta y cumplida y, y se ha hablado de la necesidad de llevar la protección y la justicia más cerca a las personas. Otras comisiones como la Comisión de Manejo de Ecosistemas, la Comisión de Educación y Comunicación, la Comisión de Especies también están haciendo eh, su, sus esfuerzos desde este punto de vista. En, desde el secretariado, ustedes probablemente han visto pronunciamientos o, o lo que se llama en inglés statements para visibilizar a los defensores ambientales y quisiera también tomar aquí un respiro para decir que nuestros miembros alrededor del mundo hacen una gran labor. Son los miembros los que están más cerca de estos defensores ambientales. Hemos visto y sale la bandera al Comité Nacional de Miembros de la UICN en Holanda, pero también hemos visto a comités nacionales en América Latina, en, en África y a comités regionales impulsando este tema. No es sorpresa que la, que la moción 039 haya salido precisamente del foro de miembros de la UICN que se realizó en Paraguay en agosto, en agosto hace un año. Fue, fue, ahí, ajá, fue ahí donde salió esta moción. Permítame terminar, me imagino que Kristen me iba a decir eso, eh, 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 dándoles gracias a todos ustedes por este panel, pero también 
resaltando la el derecho a la vida, la libertad de expresión sin temor a represalias y el derecho a la tierra y el derecho a un ambiente sano están totalmente ligados. Y con eso déjenme terminar diciendo que Wisen está comprometida a seguir en esta, en esta vía de proteger los derechos de los defensores ambientales con acciones positivas para que esta pandemia, porque eso también es una pandemia, pare y paremos de estar oyendo nombres de personas que mueren en defensa de los derechos de nuestro planeta, un planeta que todos compartimos. Muchas gracias. Greta, thank you so much for providing um, such a substantive overview of IUCN and the large weight from the role of the commissions to the secretariat to the members themselves and how the work um, both impacts the issues of environmental defenders, impacts the people, the names of the people, the organizations, and the work of IUCN overall. Um, and moving along and looking at how we could help get broader support and broader discussion and understanding lessons learned from the human rights field. I'd like to ask Mary Lauer, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Environmental Defender, Defenders, to talk a little bit about lessons learned from the human rights field, but also some thoughts about how we can improve engagement um, across uh, different uh, experiences and communities. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, and thanks very much for having me here today. Uh, I have to say I've learned a lot, and I don't know that you're going to learn anything from me, but I'll have a bash anyway. Um, I'd like to start by saying that although we speak about environmental human rights defenders, in my experience, it is often the case that people defending the right to a healthy environment are simultaneously involved in the defense of other human rights, whether it's the right to food, the right to drinking water, women's rights, or indigenous people's rights. And I just want to make two points by way of this. The first is that the right to a healthy environment is interconnected with other rights, and so their violations are intersecting, meaning we need connected intersectional responses to them. And the second is that the same is true uh, about effective support for human rights defenders, including those who might be referred to as environmental defenders. Uh, who are facing these violations. Support to them, uh, for support to them to be effective, it has to come from an understanding of the nature of their work, the context they work in, as well as extremely importantly, the factors that put them at risk. Um, because defenders are at risk for defending the environment, yes, but at the same time, they may also be at risk for speaking out about human rights as women in patriarchal societies, or as ethnic minorities in contexts ingrained with ethnic discrimination. Similarly, defenders of the environment often make dangerous enemies, as we've heard, when they challenge powerful economic, social, and political elites, including businesses, or when they fight for justice and accountability for past human rights and uh, violations connected to the environment, such as illegal land seizures. Uh, I'd like to give you an example of some of the kind of work that human rights defenders have done and continue to do. And we've heard from, Lu uh, from Judy and from others, uh, but this example comes from Honduras. Last week, a tropical storm Eta hit large parts of Central America. And in Honduras, it affected nine out of the country's 18 departments, causing massive damage and disruption, including to health services and access to food, putting people's dignity and lives at risk. In response, Ofrana, a grassroots Garifuna indigenous peoples organization has organized an international solidarity campaign to try and get essentials to those who need them. Earlier on in the pandemic, they set up service centers to help contain the pandemic in Garifuna communities with community members making masks, collecting information on pre-existing illnesses and distributing food where it was needed. And that's just one example. Defenders are doing similarly valuable work in many parts of the world, yet they, like many defenders, find themselves at risk because of that work. Uh, for years, members of the Garifuna com community have been targeted with threats and acts of intimidation for defending the right uh, to land of uh, the Garifuna communities against encroachment by unsustainable tourist development and agro-food industries, and that is why they need uh, support. Now, 
Uh, coming to the IUCN, it has a huge platform and expertise on environmental matters, and it can be a real ally, ally for human rights defenders and those working on issues related to the environment in particular. Uh, so one question maybe IUCN could, uh, could ask itself is, how, what, can, what can the IC, I, IUCN do to encourage states to take up their obligations to protect human rights defenders? And to me, part of the answer to this is would be for the IUCN to use its platform and relationships with states to show the connections between conservation, the protection of the environment, and the work of human rights defenders. We know that states around the world have committed to conservation efforts and environmental protection. So the IUCN could uh, make the case as to why protection of human rights defenders should be part of that. Uh, also, the IUCN has partnerships with development banks, and we know that development finance is, in, as, is administered without any input from defenders. The IUCN could use its existing partnerships with development banks to create spaces for human rights defenders to try to influence their policies and to advocate for provisions around the protection of human rights defenders in investment agreements. And the same goes for the IUCN's partnership with the World Bank. And uh, the IUCN also has a list of partnerships with business, some of whom are in energy, tourism, food production and clothing sectors which we know can be involved in situations where environmental human rights defenders are at risk. How many of them have human rights defender policies? Are they uh, respecting the UN guiding principles on business and human rights? Uh, maybe the IUCN could use this unique relationship with its business partners to ask these questions and encourage businesses to support defenders and respect, to respect, human, and respect human rights. So, I mean, you already consider human rights defenders as allies in the fight to protect the environment. And uh, it's really good to see how uh, the engagement with human rights defenders in IUCN's work is happening and how creating spaces for them to share their knowledge has much to contribute. Um, so there are just a few ideas and thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you, Mary, much appreciated. And I think some of the issues you raised, I think Gretel also has raised as well, utilizing the platform for IUCN and the voice of IUCN as a whole to work and influence governments, um, to look at the relationship with development banks and the funding related to development banks, and then also look at um, the business that are being engaged by IUCN through the Secretariat, but also through the membership of IUCN. I'm gonna pass it to Bill to talk a little bit about making that connection between the roadmap and mobilizing action with IUCN. Um, we are running short on time, but I recognize we have some questions popping up, which I'm trying to manage. Um, so we will run over just to, I know some people may have to leave as the panelists, but we, I would like to entertain a few questions um, before we close as well. So Peter, I'll, I'll give it to you to sort of wrap that up a little bit. Thank, thank you so much, Kristen. And I hope you can see, uh, I quickly shared here an overview of the Geneva roadmap and the four action goals, which we actually looked at and adopted earlier this year. And it's, it's a very loose framework as, as, as Yves Lado also explained, but it's, it's something I wanna show here is how actually we each and every one of us from our different institutional realms can contribute to in, in different ways. And let me just pop that up on the screen here. Uh, the, what I've indicated in red here shows the kinds of ways that we might think of, and that I think it resonates a lot with what we've just heard, how to mobilize the force of the union, how to really engage even more about those urgent issues that we see, and how to, first one, first action goal is about reversing the tide of marginalization, how to sort of cover, confront these series of attacks against environmental actors. As, as we heard from Mary as well, union membership and, and Greta, union membership of 1,400 members is an immense platform that potentially could be mobilized to support defenders. They are being mobilized in some cases, in some cases less. I think the, the upcoming resolution 
uh, which hopefully will be adopted, will send a clear signal that this is international policy for the IUCN. So there's a key issue there. Um, also in terms of its policy work, it's good to see the, the senior policy advisor for IUCN also listening in on this conversation, how to really maintain that focus on, on uh, um, environmental human rights defenders, maintaining that focus in the 2020 biodiversity frame, uh, post 2020 biodiversity framework will be critical. Uh, it's something we also emphasize in the upcoming peace and conservation letters. And action goal number two, basically how to reinforce environmental rights, enabling civic spaces and accountability. Now here's something that we often hear about uh, this unique space of encounters between state, civil society and academia and experts and so on in, in IUCN. Can we integrate defender perspectives in IUCN programs and dialogue spaces? There's a huge basis here, as also mentioned by Mary, uh, the, the business engagements, human rights engagements, and overall policy recommendations. Uh, policy recommendations. Action goal three, bridging initiatives, enhancing cooperation. Again, how can we strengthen mobilizing membership and commissions as networks of solidarity, action, and cooperation, sending that signal to defender networks that the conservation community can stand up for those at risk. So, Indeed, uh, the same also with the human rights community. And finally, the fourth point about trying to really break that isolation of defenders and securing effective access to protection. IUCN can play a role in reaching out further to its membership, its partners and communities and training and building and so on. So I, I, I want to really sort of end with, with that idea that the Geneva roadmap for the IUCN is a moment to build back better. When we speak about the IUCN vision of a just world that values and conserves nature, let's make that one where there's room for defenders. Let's make sure that that resolution is adopted with strong wording. And I know there have been questions also coming up in the audience about, well, what about this resolution on defenders and whistleblowers? It's absolutely crucial, which among other things, uh, this resolution also calls for um, developing an IUCN policy and action plan on this it's about dialogue with individual state members. It's about campaigns. And it's about including uh, defender issues in the IUCN program. And I, I've tried to list here on the right just the, the sheer number of co-sponsors, the majority indeed, as, as Gretel emphasized, also from, from the Latin American constituencies. This is a serious membership issue. It's a conservation reality. And I think we have a clear momentum here to make the World Conservation Congress and the IUCN moment here as a game changer that really puts defender action not at, at sort of uh, something that happens and we react to, uh, but rather something that's central to, to the work of conservation. And I mean, I think there's a, as we've heard from people, there's a serious scope here to engage with membership, national committees and commissions even more. So let me stop there and just say that the momentum is there, and I think I mean it's really encouraging to hear the, the the kinds of contributions from both membership and the secretariat today. So, Kristen, let's open up the floor for for discussion. Sure, thank you, Peter. Um, and I just want to remind you that, as Gretel said, that this motion will be discussed at the IUCN Congress that's coming up, and that this session is one in a series that we will be doing building up to the IUCN Congress. Um, I'm gonna just jump in. I have a number of questions that have been in the box um, that I'm just gonna put out to the, to, to the panelists. Um, from Scott Head Joyce, there is an environmental defenders and whistleblowers motion, which we have discussed for the IUCN members assembly. Um, Whistleblowers can be environmental defenders. The US has a strong whistleblower protection and reward laws with broad international scope and the EU, EU has a new whistleblower directive. Would the panelists comment on the role of whistleblowers? I'm not sure if anyone would like to comment on the role of whistleblowers. I, Let me, I, I, uh, go ahead. Peter. No, I, I would say it's absolutely essential, and indeed, the the, the association uh, that that Scott represents, of course, is is a, is, a, is indeed a co-sponsor of, of the resolution. So, so it's part and parcel of this effort. Uh, whistleblowers aren't the only ones, of course, and I think that the, the scope of IUCN action in that respect is also broader and inclusive, and indeed a, a very strong platform to 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 bring this on board. Uh, but I think again, the spirit of of the IUCN as 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 
as a union that brings together these different perspectives is, is, is crucial. And indeed, if we can learn from uh, countries that have existing policy frameworks in place on, on, on whistleblower action and so on, even better. I think there's, uh, the next step is really indeed then not just to be in, in sort of the reactive mode, but also be in the preventive mode and be able to show the kinds of, of policy frameworks that are useful to create enabling environments for whistleblowers and wider defender groups. Okay, um, I'm going to join the next question. Um, there is a request, is there an overview of policies and strategies of governments and donors regarding human rights and peace building related to natural resources, especially forestry? Any insights or knowledge into an overview or a publication that would, um, would get someone to that? Also in that, in that line, um, a recommended grievance mechanism that local people could use as well. I don't have any references on the top of my head, but clearly this is this is literature in the making. And I, I believe Bernd uh, was the one asking this question, Bernd Unger. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. I think it's something probably that that we we may need to think of of, of specific policy briefs that actually perhaps articulate this. And, and perhaps that's also something that could be thought of in relation to your organizational work in, uh, that uh, you, you've been mentioning uh, in the chat. Um, then there was also a question um, from Judy, actually, um, related to the UN Human Rights Council resolutions, which express, actually, Judy, you're there. Why don't you just ask your question out? Yeah, um, I think I, wanna, I want to uh, tie that with what Miss Mary Lawler has uh, mentioned. Um, it's, it's actually a challenge for the, or a suggestion for IUCN to use its uh, its influence on member states to to protect human rights defenders and i was saying that the flip side of it would also be to condemn authoritarian governments which are clearly violating human rights violation uh, human rights of defenders and indigenous peoples so uh, to be able to protect it's also the other side of it is to strongly come out of the position to condemn uh, authoritarian governments which is the Philippines and Brazil, for that matter. Um, so um, a clear, a clear uh, opportunity is the Human Rights Council resolution that has uh, been passed recently, and it fell short on the previous statement of the Human Rights Council in condemning the extrajudicial killings of the, of uh, including indigenous peoples and land rights defenders. Uh, it it only spoke of technical cooperation, and so the clamor of human rights organization, including us here and abroad, is to push for an independent investigation uh, of, the, of the human rights violations of the Duterte government. And so I was thinking if it's that, if those kinds of campaigns in the agenda of IUCN for being more um, proactive in protecting human rights uh, defenders. Thanks, Judy. I also want to um, just maybe before I open up to Gretel to, to sort of give a response, there was also um, a proposal here about a broader collaboration with the Goldman Environmental Prize as well. Um, so maybe looking at Judy's, um, Judy's question, but also thinking about the issues of the Goldman Environmental Prize. Can I just say something? Mary, I have to... Sure, sure Mary. Uh, uh, just a few things. First of all, I think maybe the IUCN might consider setting up its own prize um, because the more awards you have, the better. Um, it means so much to defenders, um, to their morale and to their credibility and the, uh, that comes with international recognition. So that's something just maybe, you know, you could think about. Uh, the second thing is in, in relation uh, to Judy, uh, as Judy, <laughs> uh, I, I always feel so terrible when I have to say these kinds of things, but the UN is a collection of member states and they are the ones, and it is the governments who decide on, uh, it's the, it's the uh, protection of human rights defenders is a government responsibility. Each government is supposed to protect their own. Uh, human rights defenders. Now, there's all sorts of political considerations at play, as you know, in the UN. So, 
as I understood, because I did take up this whole business about the resolution, as I, as I understand, uh, the, the states were endeavouring to get some form of cooperation with the Philippine government. Now, it, it, to, I mean, obviously, you know, there can be a dialogue of the deaf and there can be uh, dialogue for the sake of dialogue. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it is the networks on the ground that spread upwards and outwards that are going to bring about protection of human rights defenders. I'm really sorry, I have to go. I'm already late for the next uh, um, meeting. Sorry. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Bye. Thank you, Mary. We appreciate Thank your you. time. Gretel? Thank you. Thank you for all the, um, the, the, the comments and suggestions that many of you are, are doing to IUCN. I think that are, are all very valuable. Uh, just to respond to the question, um, if IUCN will be able to bring to the government, um, you know, the, the, the information related to being more active in terms of transparency and bringing justice um, to, to the cases. I have to say that we have done that and you can Google it. I mean, you, for example, last, last year, um, and I have to say that it was during my term as acting Director General, um, uh, we call uh, the governments of, for Nicaragua and Mexico uh, to bring justice to the, to the cases that happened in 2019. We did also that for the uh, cases in, in Iran. So for IUCN, it's not new to call governments, you know, to have fair processes, uh, specifically to call governments to bring justice to these cases and to do the proper investigations. Also, previous, um, previous director generals have done that. Of course, that we, that we take good care of the details. We, you know, we do an analysis of the cases to be sure of what we are doing and what we are doing is right. Because as you know, we are based on science and we are based on, on evidence. And there are many, 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 many cases. So it is not so easy for a UCN, uh, you know, this, this uh, worldwide voice, um, to, to send this letter just, you know, uh, very quickly because someone is telling us that something is happening. We, we are serious about, but when we, about this, but when we do it, we do it. And, and I think that that is, that is one thing that it will continue happening. Um, so ju just, just to say that, of course, we can always improve. I mean, there, I mean, there is always room for improvement and, and that, that is very clear. Great. I will end with one more question, and it comes from Holly Jonas um, from the ICA Consortium. A growing number of conservation organizations is expressing support for environmental human rights defenders, but many concerns remain about conservation organizations themselves violating human rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, among others, such as the top-down protected areas, mil militarization of enforcement units, criminalization of customary and system ways of life. Um, the question is to any of the panelists, what do you think are the responsibilities of conservation organizations in this regard? So that's a big question. Um, and perhaps it's, it's one that we won't fully answer today and may need another session for, but I would ask if anyone would like to give some initial comments before we close. Eve? Well, just very briefly, I think it's a very important question indeed. Um, we know that the World Wildlife and International has gone under very severe critique, but they have answered to this, uh, and this is something which still is going on, with an internal inquiry, uh, in, which includes the, the former uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, Professor John Knox. So I think it's we have to see what will be the outcome, and it will be a very good starting point for discussion within the conservation community uh, to see how to uh, avoid really uh, 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 mistakes which can be uh, damageable for the people and for the, for the environment. Uh, also on the positive side, let's say that the, the last report of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, the new mandate holder, Professor David Boyd, um, the last report he did just a few weeks ago to the UNGA on human rights and biodiversity and ecosystems also provides an excellent basis for a discussion between uh, the human rights field and, and the conservation sector. It really lays down um, 
all of the different issues and, and highlights also the responsibilities of conservation organizations uh, in a very good way. So I think we have here with this first basis from the report which has been presented to the UNGA and to the coming reports coming out of the uh, uh, fact-finding process within World Wildlife Fund, we will have interesting uh, documents to start this discussion. Thank you. Um, and with Eve's comment, I, I will end here. And I would also propose that this particular set of questions and what Eve brought today will be brought up in another dialogue and discussion. So Holly, we will reach out to you to work on that. Um, I would like to thank you all for your time and your effort today. Um, this is not the end of this conversation. Um, this is the beginning and we need to keep moving this roadmap um, forward. Um, this will be posted to the C uh, site. Um, please join us. We have a number of virtual dialogues coming up related to peace and migration, related to gender, related to governance issues, which all do weave in with these, this particular set of issues as well. So I do invite you to join us back and check the IUCN website for those dialogues. Thank you all for your time and effort. Um, and we will be in touch as we continue to do this follow up. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our interpreters. Thank you. Thanks and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks thank indeed. you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.